electrostatics, electric potential. We have quite a bit of work to do. We'll talk about the general concept of what the electric potential is. And then we need to talk about the potential difference because in fact, what the potential is doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is if there's a potential difference between two points. Then we can talk about the potential due to a charge. We can talk more about the relationship between the electric field intensity and V. Way back in the beginning when we were talking about Maxwell's equations, we said that the electric field intensity E is most closely associated with voltage. So we need to talk about that relationship. And then we'll work through an example. Let's talk about just the concept of electric potential. Remember from vector calculus, we said that the curl of the gradient of a scalar function is always zero. We even had that picture, the Escher picture, with the staircase that's constantly increasing. So we have this general vector identity. The gradient of a scalar function can never have curl. Well, in electrostatics, Faraday's law reduces to the curl of E equals zero. That means in electrostatics, the electric field cannot have curl. So this means we must be able to write the electric field as the gradient of some other function. And in fact, that other function is what we call the electric potential. We include a negative sign just to enforce our sign convention that the electric field will point from positive to negative. So here's what I think is a pretty good way to get an intuitive feel about what the, the relation is between the electric field and the potential. So we have two parallel plates separated by some medium and there's a distance D between those plates and I apply a voltage V naught to them. Well, we sort of know from circuit theory, if that medium between the plates is slightly resistive, that we're going to get this linear taper of voltage from one plate to the other. So if we define the bottom plate as zero volts, then the voltage will linearly increase to the top plate to be finally a voltage of V naught. When we apply that voltage, we know that puts charges on the plates. And we'll assume that this is a uniform charge on both the top and the bottom plate. Well, we now know from our previous lectures, when we have charged plates, we'll have an electric field. We also know that the field is uniform away from uniform charges. So we have an electric field and it's uniform. So if the potential varies linearly between the plates, but the electric field is constant, the conclusion we get is that the electric field is the slope of voltage. And we can generalize this to three dimensions and say that the electric field is the negative gradient of potential. So we arrived at that equation rigorously through vector calculus, and we also did it through sort of a hand-waving qualitative argument. The last thing I'd like to leave you with here is that the electric potential and the electric field are not two different phenomena. We are describing the same phenomenon, just two different ways mathematically. So it's important to realize that. The electric field is a vector quantity, the electric potential is a scalar quantity. It's just easier a lot of times to analyze things with scalar quantities instead of vector quantities. So in electrostatics, you'll see very much things analyzed through the potential instead of the electric field. But if we know the potential, we just calculate the negative gradient and we'll have the electric field. Later on, we'll derive an equation to go the other way around. If we know the electric field, how do we calculate the potential? Potential difference. So we have a setup where we have some electric field and we would like to know what the potential difference is between two points. Now, interestingly, from this analysis, we won't have any idea what the potential is at either of those points. 
all we will ever know is what the potential difference is. So the potential at point A might really be 100 million volts, and at point B, 100 million 10 volts, but all we can get from this is that there's 10 volt difference between them. But actually, it's only ever the potential difference that matters. If we have two points held at the same potential, there's no potential there to do work with, so that really does not matter. And it also goes back to, could I sit in a chair that's charged to 100 million volts? I absolutely could, as long as everything around me is also charged to 100 million volts. There's no potential difference to drive electricity through me and to kill me. So it's only ever potential difference that matters. So to establish what the potential difference is between two points, we'll let there be a charge Q, and we're going to look at this in terms of how much work it takes to move that charge from point A to point B and derive the potential difference from that. So we always start, for the sign convention, we start at point A, and here we have a charge Q, and we're going to move it to point B over a distance D. So the force on that charge, since it's in the presence of an electric field, is F times QE. The work done to move that charge from mechanics, work is force times distance. So we set up that equation, work equals force times distance. And we're going to put a negative sign in here because the, the electric field is external to this. And so our force is Q times E from the above equation. And notice I'm just using the magnitude of E here because work is not a vector quantity. We take this equation and differentiate it. So we get a differential work. When we differentiate F times D, we'll get a minus F dot DL. And then we can differentiate this last term. We get a minus Q E dot DL. So that gives us our differential work. And what we'll do is integrate that along any path from A to B. So we can write our integral, integrating the work from A to B. And then we can substitute in this last expression for dW and bring minus Q to the outside because they're constants. And what we see is we just have a line integral of the electric field from A to B. I'll also mention it's independent of the path chosen. So right now I'm just showing a path that's going straight because that's simple, but I could also integrate along another path. I could do a square path. I could meander around and end up at B. So the path does not matter. Same amount of work will be calculated. So we're free to choose the path that just makes the math easier. Now the potential difference between the points is defined as the potential energy per unit charge. So we need to calculate the energy and then divide by the charge Q. In a sense, we're sort of normalizing it to the charge Q. And so the way we'll do this is the potential energy is the work it's taking to move that charge from A to B. So we have our expression for work that we derived on the previous slide. Well, we want to divide this by Q. So we'll take the Q from the right-hand side over to the left. Now we have the energy per unit charge. This is the energy per unit charge. This has to be our expression for potential difference between A and B. And in fact, that's where we are. So we can write it this way, the potential difference between A and B is simply VB minus VA. Notice we don't know the value of either one of these. We only ever need to know the difference. And that's the minus line integral of the electric field. And it's also always important in terms of the sign convention that A is the starting point. If we swapped that, we'd also have to swap the sign. So in the end, here's our equation. Before we presented equation, we said the electric field is a negative gradient of potential, and we would use that to calculate the electric field from potential. This is the equation we use to calculate potential from the electric field.
Let's end this discussion with some notes about potential difference. As I keep mentioning, it's important in terms of the sign convention to understand that A will be the initial point, B is the final point. If we decide to swap that, we also have to swap the sign. If our potential difference is less than zero, there's work being done by our field and there's an overall loss in the potential energy. That's what the negative indicates. So if it's positive, then we're actually getting potential energy and there must be something else doing work on our charge to help us. The potential difference between A and B is independent of the path taken. So we can do any crazy path we want to. Typically, we choose whatever makes the math the easiest. We measure potential difference in joules per coulomb or just volts. Now let's talk about the electric potential due to a point charge. Because if we understand that, it's straightforward then to look at the potential due to a charge distribution. So we start with the picture of a point charge that we've talked about before, and we have the electric flux density, the D field calculated around that charge, and it had a one over R squared decay in its magnitude. So we put an equation to that. We would like to figure out what the electric potential is around that point charge. However, the electric potential is calculated from the electric field intensity E and not D. So our next step has to be to get the electric field intensity. And we do that by dividing by the permittivity of the medium. And so we get our expression for the electric field intensity. So let's go ahead and derive the electric potential from the electric field intensity. Let's set up our problem. Well, the electric field approaches infinity on the charge. So whatever integration we have to do has to avoid being on top of the point charge. So it makes sense to integrate from infinity to an observation point, And that avoids having to go near the charge. So we know what the electric field intensity is as a function of radius r. What is the electric potential? So we will use our line integral to do that. And we need a boundary condition. The electric field infinitely far away from the charge is zero. And the potential infinitely away from the charge is just some background potential that we choose. It goes back to the example where I said I could sit in a chair of 100 million volts as long as everything else around me is charged to 100 million volts, it doesn't matter. So that V ref is that background potential. Very often that's just set to zero and it's sort of implied, but we'll put it in here just to be complete. So we have some background potential and we'll integrate this line integral from A to B to calculate what the potential is at some distance R from that point charge. So we'll start with the basic equation for our potential difference, VB minus VA equals the negative line integral of the electric field, E dot DL. So instead of writing VB minus VA, we'll write VR minus V ref. Remember V ref is the potential at point A, and we are trying to find the potential at point B. We know the electric field, that's Q over four pi epsilon R squared with a unit vector in the direction from the point charge to our observation point. And our differential length is simply in the R direction in spherical coordinates. And so our limits of integration in the R direction is from infinity to R. So now let's do the math. Here's the equation from the last slide. The first thing we can do to simplify our problem is bring constants to the outside. Well, Q, 4, pi, and epsilon are all constants that we can bring to the outside. We can also perform the dot product. And so since both of these vectors are in the R direction, our dot product is simply 
this expression times this expression we bring the constants to the outside all we're left with is 1 over r squared dr and our limits don't change infinity to r is how we're integrating 1 over r squared is easy to integrate we'll calculate the antiderivative we can bring the negative sign to the outside make things a little bit easier then evaluate that expression at our limits and simplify so the potential at a distance r from our charge is this expression plus our background potential and so that came from this side i brought that over to the right so that's why we're adding now so we have our expression for the potential at some distance r from a point charge this part of the expression really is due to the point charge and then we just add whatever background reference potential that we have and here's another way we can write the same equation that's maybe a little bit more useful for calculation so we have the vector position of our charge and the vector position of where we're observing the charge so if we were going to visualize the electric potential it would look like this this is not a vector quantity so this is just a pure cloud it's not a cloud with a direction associated with it. Now, different than the electric field, which had a 1 over r squared dependence, notice we only have a 1 over r dependence. So, in fact, this decays a little bit more slowly than the electric field. It's straightforward now to extend this to charge distributions. We just discussed a point charge. And notice I'm writing the expression for the electric potential without that background or reference potential added in. And that's just implied. We could have a line charge, of course, described by a line charge density. And now here's our expression for the electric potential. We could have a sheet charge. Or we could have a volume charge. And the volume charge is the only one that's physically real. Everything else is just a simplification of a volume charge. And very often, it's very accurate to do that. And it really does simplify the math. Now I'd like to do an interesting example. It involves numbers, and it also involves a, a simulation that does not have a closed form answer. So I think it should be pretty fun. So we have two charged objects. One is set to VA and the other is set to VB. So there's a potential difference between them. They have different charges. That establishes an electric field between them that we're looking at here. And we can even now see the electric field fringing from one to the other. And that's pretty neat. Based on what we see here, the intensity of the electric field, we would like to evaluate what the potential difference is between those two objects. We will not know what the potential is at either one. We will only ever know what the difference is between them. So this means we have to do a line integral. So we'll integrate along some path from A to B of negative E dot DL. We need to choose a path for that integration. And all we've really said so far is we should do this path that makes the integration or the math easiest. So one thing that makes it easy is if we choose a path that's always parallel to the electric field. So I've drawn three different paths here where each is parallel to the electric field. And those would probably be the easiest. If we choose it so that it's always parallel to the electric field, then the dot product E dot DL is simply just always the magnitude of E times the differential length. If the electric field were misaligned, not parallel to the path, then the dot product would reduce it some, and that would make the math a little bit more difficult. Let's proceed with that center path. To do this visually, while that'll just be approximation, we're going to have to pretend that the electric field is constant along our path. And we've chosen a path where, eh, maybe that's roughly true. So given that the electric field is constant, our line integral would simply reduce to negative whatever that constant value is times the length of the path that we've chosen. 
So we can do this graphically from the image to the right. The first thing we'll do is take that line path from where it was and move it down to the x-axis. We're doing this to see how long it is. And uh, I estimate it's somewhere around 1.7 long. We also need to know the magnitude of the electric field. So I'll pick where I think it has its closest average value, maybe somewhere around here. And it's a greenish color. I'll come over here and match that color. And that means that the magnitude of the electric field is around 7. And the assumption is, is that it'll be 7 continuously from A to B. We see that that's not quite true, but it is pretty close to being true. And it lets us solve this problem visually. So now we plug these numbers into what our line integral reduced to, and which was minus magnitude of E times L. We got 7 for the magnitude of E and 1.7 for the length. And so we get minus 11.9 volts between VA and VB. That does not mean that VA is at 11.9 volts or VB. We don't know what VA and VB are. We just know what the difference is between them, which is negative 11.9 volts. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that negative? What does that mean? What does that imply? Well, remember how we've defined our line integral. It's VB minus VA. So if we get a negative answer from that, that must mean that the potential on object A is higher than the potential on object B. That way VB minus VA becomes a negative number. Other than that, we can't conclude anything else.